He knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He knew he was the resurrection and the life. But Jesus wept. God's character is unchanging. It is the same yesterday, today and forever. Our world is constantly changing. The coronavirus pandemic has emphasised how uncertain and unreliable our world is and how fragile, anxious and needy people can be. Only trust in Jesus' perfect nature can guarantee peace in the storm. Coronavirus, where is God in the storm? This is a common question that is in my heart, in your heart, in everyone's heart right now. Where is God in the storm? We know the the story of Jesus crossing the lake and he's right there in the boat uh, during the storm and he calms the storm, brings peace to the storm. We know that. But if you're not a believer, you're probably asking, where is God in this coronavirus global pandemic? It's people dying. 47,000 people have died. It's April 2nd today, 2020. 47,000 deaths in Australia. We've got 20 Three people have died so far. We're all stuck in self-isolation in our homes. Where is God during this? It's easy for us to think, well, you know, if I was God, I, I, I would stop this. Or, or why wouldn't God uh, intervene? Why would God permit this in the first place? Why would he permit anything? Children suffering, slavery, hardship, pain. Why doesn't he take it all away? For many, this, this is a question. For some, it isn't a question at all because uh, there is no God. Uh, the atheistic uh, worldview and mindset. God was buried by science 200 years ago. We haven't needed him for many centuries now because he's not there. We've got science, we've got our wisdom, we've got education, we've got our politicians, though they will save the day. For some Christians, they jump straight to, well, this pandemic is happening because God is judging the world and it's God's justice because we're sinful and we need to get on our knees and cry out to him. Look, I don't think that's it either. I think we live in a fallen world. God created a perfect world, man sin, and now we live in a fallen world and bad stuff happens. There is suffering, there is pain, but God is not cursing the world or trying to draw us back to him uh, through pain and through pandemic. He draws us to him through his loving kindness. Really, the world is the way that it should be if it's cursed by darkness and by our own evil desires and sin. Pandemics happen, diseases happen. You know, I was listening to a podcast this week and N.T. Wright was talking about this very question, where is God in the coronavirus, in the pain and suffering? And he spoke about Jesus being at the tomb of Lazarus and weeping. And that's where we're going to go today because that is the character trait, the unchanging character of God that I want to talk about today, this dimension of God's empathy. He has compassion for us. He understands our every need. He is right there with us. He's in the boat during the storm with us. He cries on our shoulder with us. He feels pain. He's a man of sorrow. He's right there alongside us. Hebrews 4.15. Let me read this scripture because it, it, it says it beautifully. We do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with us in our weakness, but we have one who is tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Jesus can empathize with your situation, with my situation, with everyone's situation, because he came down to earth and lived life as a human being. You know, empathy is a, it's a funny thing. I don't know about you, but for me, my personality, my upbringing, I don't know. I just always struggled to show empathy. Uh, I'm very much like a just, you know, toughen up kind of person. Just, you know, sort out your problems. Just be better, be stronger. And, and empathy is something I've had to really work on. But thank God Jesus has worked in my heart and I've grown in that a lot. Still got growing to do. But, you know, it's a powerful, powerful thing when we can show another person understanding. Not sympathy and just say, oh, I'm sorry for you. But empathy is putting ourselves in their shoes and trying to experience life from their perspective. And no one does this better than God. And not, no other time have I seen this better than a number of years ago. It was about four years ago. I did the second funeral that I've ever done. And I, I buried uh, this beautiful little girl. She wasn't even two years old and she died uh, during the night. And I, I never forget going around to visit the parents uh, locally uh, near where I live. And um, they were just so distraught. They already had a, a child that was about three and then this was their second child. I was there with the mum 
the dad sitting there at the kitchen table and their daughter a few days earlier had died in her sleep, cot death. What do you say? Um, how do you explain that? How does God fit into this? Where's the justice in this? What do I do as a pastor? I'm not going to preach at them. Do I tell them to not grieve? I, I, it was so difficult. And all I could do is, is cry with them, weep with them. When I got to the funerals, I'm running this funeral. I'm crying. I'm emotional because I'm, I'm, I'm getting in touch with what maybe they're going through a little bit. And then we went out to bury this child, a tiny little coffin that just absolutely breaks your heart. And they, they, they put her in the ground. And then all the men started picking up shovels and shoveling the dirt to fill up the grave. And, and I was just weeping. I was just crying. And that was the only way that I could help. That was the only way that I could be there was to empathize with them in their pain, was to feel their pain, was to try and cry alongside of them. There's nothing you can really say in that moment, but, but, but to understand, not just try to understand or try to see their perspective, but actually get in their shoes, stand alongside the, uh, at the funeral and the burial with them. And these men just, I'll never forget it, just picking up these shovels, embracing the pain, showing empathy by refilling that grave so it was a powerful, powerful thing. You know, for God, he lost his child as well. He lost his son as well. He, he can empathize with us when, when, even in death and when we lose. God doesn't sit in heaven and understand us from up on high in this place of perfection. No, God came down here to earth through Jesus Christ. He got in the trenches with us. He, he got his hands dirty he, Jesus shed himself with his divinity, God himself, and he came down here onto the earth to feel our pain, to experience the temptation, to go through the suffering. He's been here right with us. You know, God's heart gets heavy. It gets troubled. I, I think of God in, in, in Genesis 6 when he looks down at his creation and he's just he's so regretful of what's happened. And he knows he's got to wipe out mankind off the earth and, and, and deal with the sin and the evil. And, and it says in Genesis 6 that his heart was heavy and his spirit was troubled. And he was, he was grieving because of mankind and what they had become. God feels. God knows. And in Jesus Christ, the king of all the earth came down from heaven to us. The beggars, the poor, the, the, ones, the ones that live natural earthly lives. He, he shed himself of all his perfection, his power, his glory, his majesty. He shed all of that. He separated himself from the, from the Father. And he came down here to the earth. A king coming down to the commoners in order to spend time with us, in order to be with us, in order to experience humanity, in order to live in a, in a fragile body and live in a futile world to show us that there is meaning, that there is hope, that there is, we can put our faith in God, that there is something more than this life and this earth. And the story of Lazarus just paints this unchanging character trait of God's empathy, his compassion, his understanding better than anything else I could find in the Bible. If you want to turn with me, feel free to. It's, the story is in John chapter 11. And Jesus is informed a few days before Lazarus dies, it is informed that Lazarus is sick, but he doesn't go down straight away to, to visit him. And it's not until four days later that he comes. Lazarus is already uh, in the tomb at this point. And in verse 21, Martha runs out to meet him and says to, to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother who was sick, he wouldn't have died. And Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. Yes, yes, I know, Lord, says Martha, he'll, he'll rise at the end of time. The last day, the, who, the resurrection of the, the dead in the last day. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. I am the resurrection and the life. It's not going to happen just at the end of time. I'm here right now with life and with resurrection power. Jesus says, the one who believes in me will live even though they die. This is verse 25. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. You know, I always tell my children that, that one day you won't really die, but you'll go to sleep. You go to sleep for a time, but you'll always live. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you will be alive forevermore. Coronavirus, pandemic, worldwide global issues, 
you've lost your job, financial stress, all kinds of things are going to go on during this coronavirus. And guess what? They're going to keep going on. Life is full of troubles, full of temptations, full of offenses. But guess what Jesus said? I have overcome the world. Guess what Jesus said? I am the resurrection and the life. Guess what? He has overcome even death himself. And I want to tell you that no matter what you're going through, God understands and he empathizes with you. He's here. Just think of Jesus there at the tomb of Lazarus. That is the God that we serve. He's a God that meets our needs. He's a God that meets us in our pain, but he doesn't just leave us there. He brings resurrection life. He brings power, whether whether it's resurrecting our, our mind and renewing it and getting our thought processes right, whether it's changing our heart and, and helping us deal with the sin and the infection that comes into our heart and making it clean again, whether it's salvation itself and him on the cross suffering and going through pain so we don't have to suffer and go through the pain of our error and our mistakes and our fallingness. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Whether you've lost your job, he will resurrect your finances. He'll bring you to a new place. And whether you're stuck inside and you're feeling anxious and, and hopeless uh, during this coronavirus pandemic, Jesus Christ will show you a way through through, not just to survive, but to live life and life to the full. There is a plan that God has during this time to work everything for good. Look for his plan in this time. Look for what the Holy Ghost is saying when you're going through things. He's right there alongside you. God, the Holy Spirit, he's our counselor. He's our friend. He's there with us. He's speaking to us. You've got Yes, you've got to find a new way because this pandemic has created roadblocks and our normal lifestyles have been totally shut down but the Holy Ghost is going to show you a way through this. Don't find a way through it just to return to business as usual after the crisis. Find a way through it that's a new way and a new road and a new highway into your future calling and destiny. The kingdom of God is extending and expanding through this time. The kingdom of God is not held back by pandemics or pestilence or disease or crisis or financial ruin or anything going on in your own life, your own marriage, your own family. The kingdom of God is always advancing. It's always moving forward. But you've got to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit in this. You've got to be a person who walks by the Spirit, who walks in relationship with God, that Jesus Christ is your friend, showing you the way through but onwards and upwards, not just showing you the way through to survive and make it so we can get back to business as usual at the end of the year, or we can get back to our old thinking patterns, or we can return to even how we used to do church. No, I was, I was on a, a prayer meeting this morning, a Zoom meeting, and we we're praying about the church. And I was saying to these fellow pastors that this is a time where God is upgrading the body of Christ. We must come out of this and we must be a new church, not the same old church. Jesus walking in with, walks in with Martha and then he comes to Mary, the sister. And when he reaches that place, Mary's distraught. Mary's bawling her eyes out. In verse 33, it says that Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews that had come along, they were also weeping. And Jesus was deeply moved in spirit and he was troubled. Where have you laid him, Jesus asked. And they took him to the place of the tomb. And in John 11:35, the shortest verse in the entire Bible, it says, Jesus wept. That is the core of God's unchanging character, his empathy, his compassion, his understanding. He knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He knew he was the resurrection and the life, but Jesus wept. Can you imagine it? There's Martha, Mary crying, all the friends and family are crying. But Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is crying himself. Not just crying, but weeping, heaving, probably snotting. I don't know how you cry, but he probably ugly cried. And it, he was consumed with grief. He didn't respond with a sermon. He responded in this moment with tears, with empathy. The Son of God himself, broken down in, into a puddle of tears, just, it reminds me of Jesus Christ looking over Jerusalem. It's in Luke 19, 41. He looks over it and he cries. He weeps again over Jerusalem because they're harassed and helpless. And they don't know that he's the king of all the earth. They don't know that the day of salvation has arrived. And his heart is heavy. God's heart is heavy. As I read to you early, Hebrews 4, 15, Jesus can empathize with us in our weakness when we cry. 
when life hurts us, when we go through pain, when we're affected by things. The very picture of the Christian faith is the suffering Messiah. It's Jesus Christ himself hanging on a cross. This is what Christianity is. It centers on the cross. It centers on the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of all the world, dying an excruciating, painful death, being tortured, crying out, Abba, Father, cried, sweating um, um, droplets of blood in Gethsemane. That He was a man. It says in, I've got it right here for you, Isaiah 53. It says that he was destroyed despised, verse 3, he was rejected by human beings. Horrible pain and suffering. Is there anything worse than being rejected by people, by being misunderstood by people? But he was. Isaiah 53, verse 4, he was a man of sorrows, familiar with pain. He knew pain. He knew rejection. He knew betrayal. He knew physical suffering and torture. He knew the heartache of just being a human being, trying to live a life not given to temptation. He knew the pain of trying to connect with God in heaven. Like one whom people hide their faces from, he was despised. Not just ignored, but he was despised. He was hated. And we held him in low esteem. We didn't respect him. We didn't see him as special. Surely he took our pain and carried our sorrows. Not only was he a man of pain and of sorrow and carried all of that, the sin of the whole world to the cross. But he took our pain and our sorrows. And even though he took all of that, we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. We considered him as the reason he was in pain is because it was his own fault. We considered his pain and his suffering on the cross to be meaningless. Yet we didn't realize that this was the son of God dying for the sins of the earth, carrying the sorrow of hate and rejection and betrayal and also the physical pain of going to the cross and also the pain of separation from the father in heaven for a time. He carried all that. He is familiar with pain and suffering. The God of the universe doesn't sit there going, I'm not going to heal people. I don't want to get involved in the coronavirus. That's difficult that your finances are falling apart. You've lost your job. You're struggling. In, you're having a faith crisis in your own Christian journey. God doesn't just sit back there and observe and think, oh, those silly human beings. If you were God, you wouldn't be sitting up there going, oh, well, I'm just going to change this or I'm just going to save this or I'm just going to uh, uh, change the situation and get involved. It's just crazy. God is down here, dying on the cross, weeping at the tomb of Lazarus, in the boat, bringing peace in the storm. He's right here alongside with us. What can we do to be like Jesus Christ? Well, we can weep when others are weeping. We can be in pain and empathize with the pain of others. We can get alongside our brothers and sisters in Christ and put an arm around their shoulder when they're struggling when they're limping, we can limp alongside of them. Sometimes as a pastor, all I can do is sit in a room with someone and listen. I can prophesy, I can't preach, I can't tell them what to do. Whatever they're going through, all I can do is sit with them in their pain. All I can do is go there and, and, and sit with them in that place and, and have a downcast face and, and, and meet them in that place of pain and just listen. Just be a listening ear. Just be a friend who goes through hard times. The Bible's full of lament, full of of these depressed uh, psalms. There's a whole book called Lamentations where people cry out to God. Jesus cried out to God. Jesus cried out to God in Hebrews 5, 7. It says he offered up prayers and petitions to God with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And Jesus was heard because of his reverent submission, because his faith was in God, his hope was in God, he submitted his life to God. Therefore, he had a channel of communication. God heard and spoke. Jesus heard and spoke. And this is the model for us, that we hear him and and he speaks to us, that we listen and that we express ourselves and we cry out to him. Sometimes we cry out in tears. Sometimes we cry out in frustration. Sometimes we cry out in in torment and affliction like King David so many times in the Psalms, crying out to God. And God is there and he meets us in our pain. He meets us in our empathy. He meets us at that point every single time. If we, if we submit ourselves, if we get on our knees, if we put our faith in him, he meets us there every time. And he meets Mary and Martha, the Jews. He meets Lazarus at this point of pain. And in verse 38, says again, Jesus was deeply moved and he came to the tomb. 
and he cries out to Lazarus and he calls him out of the grave. He prays out aloud, he says, so that everyone can hear his faith. He doesn't pray aloud for his own benefit or because God maybe doesn't hear well. He knows God hears his prayers. He knows God empathizes with his situation. He He knows God well, his character well, that God wants to act in troubled times. But he prays out aloud, not for himself, but so that those listening will have faith. He says in verse 42, I know that you always hear me. And he prays out aloud and Lazarus comes forth, raised from the dead, because God is there at our point of pain, in our point of suffering. He is alongside of us, ready to act, ready to move, ready to lead us through. Now be careful because the way God acts may not be the way you expect. Just because God empathizes with us and understands He may not do what we think he needs to do to resolve our pain and our hurting. But God will act and God will bring life. The resurrection of the dead, it may not look like you think it should look like. But he is going to bring life where there's pain and where there's hurting. God knows your pain. He empathizes. God hears your cries. God sees your tears. He sees your wrestle. You know, sometimes I look at my troubles in my church, I look at my issues in my own life, my own family, I look at my struggles in my own mind, the world, everything going on, and I think, man, God must just sit up there in heaven and think, I'm just going to take care of this. Like Like a good father, it's okay. Why do you guys worry so much? Why do you guys poke each other and argue and stress each other out so much? It's okay. I've got everything in control. And he does. He has it in control. That's what faith is. It's it's that assurance is in God and his character. Not just in what he can do. Not just in he is all powerful and could act, but it's in his character that he will do the right thing. That he is the same yesterday, today and forever. That that character is unchanging so we can trust it and we can put our faith in him. As I finish, I just want to pray for you because we all go through struggles. We all go through wrestles. Let's not be Christians that overemphasize the spiritual things that are so spiritual that we never acknowledge if there's pain. We, I pray for miracles, for healings of cancer. I pray that this coronavirus will come to an end. I cry out to God when I want to see things change. But I also am in reality. Let's be realistic Christians that if there's cancer, there's cancer, and that's a problem. If you're going through pain and struggle, you need to talk. You need to get things off your chest. You might need to see someone. You need to come to a pastor. Just because you're a Christian, it doesn't mean that we don't acknowledge the reality of our circumstances, our pain, our wrestles, our crisis, our controversy. But when we cry out to God, that also doesn't affect our faith because we believe that he's going to act. But let's be careful that when he acts, Despite the fact that he empathizes with us and he understands us, when he acts, he acts in his own way. And often it's unexpected because as a human, we see like this. We're so narrow. But God sees like this. He sees everything and he acts in accordance with his will. He acts in accordance with what he's already said in the Bible. So we should know how God is going to act. He acts in accordance with his character. Know God. Know his character. Know his character. You'll know what he's going to do you'll know what he's going to say because what's in a person is what comes out of their mouth and comes out of their behavior. It's the same with God. What is in God, goodness, righteousness, a father, our healer, Jehovah Jireh, our provider. That's the only thing that will come out of God. And you can trust that. Lord, I just pray for anyone watching this video right now. I thank you that you are true that you are real, that you are powerful. You're going to come through this situation in an unexpected way and bring peace in the storm. We thank you for your unchanging character, that you are the same yesterday, today and forever, and that you are God, the God, the King of the universe, but you came down here and experienced our human, fragile, futile life and you showed us the way through. Thank you for suffering on the cross. Thank you for being the man of sorrow, familiar with pain, that you know what it's like, but you weren't, you weren't beaten by death. You weren't beaten by the cross because you are the resurrection and the life. And thank you that resurrection and life will flow right now through whoever is taking this on, this teaching on, this revelation on in faith, that resurrection power and life will flow through every part of their life in Jesus' mighty name. I hope this video has helped you. Let's help get the message out. Please like, uh, subscribe, 
um, share, comment, anything that's going to help get this message out because God is good, his character is unchanging and he is available for all mankind in a world that is constantly changing and full of pain and suffering.